My name is Andrea Plaid. I am the Arts and Culture Editor at the Twin Cities Daily Planet. And our conversation today um, is, as Peter said, about the history and presence of white supremacy in Minneapolis and the state of Minnesota. The reason why we brought this conversation forth is because we felt that there was something that was very disturbing but still not talked about in regards to what happened at the fourth city precinct, which was the presence of white supremacists who shot at the protesters. And I, mm -hmm. we felt that that was not a conversation that was being addressed in different media. So we thought that we were going to not only address it, but we're going to address it as a panel. So we asked our scholars in the community to step out a little bit further and become public intellectuals around this issue regarding the um, so presence and history of white supremacy. So let me get started with my first set of questions. But first, let me introduce who is all next to me. To my immediate left is Shannon Gibney, who is a young adult author um, and also is a instructor at the Minneapolis Ma Community and Technical College. And is a wonderful person, so <laughs> yeah. human being. Here, here. Um, and she has done incredible work. I know that I know her from the Black Women's Writers Series. She was the first one up that was coordinated with by no other than the illustrious mm -hmm. doyen of literature in the city, <laughs> um, Carolyn Holbrook. And to her left, of course, is Peter Ratcliffe, who is the, as he said, the doyen of this library. <laughs> and also was a former writer with the Twin Cities Daily Planet, as well as a former instructor at McAllister. And to his left is Keith Mays, who is an African American studies instructor over at the University of Minnesota, or as I like to say, UMen. Um, so let me start off with the first question: How do you define white supremacy, and how is and how does the way it's used in academia and social with social justice activists different than how we talk about it outside of those circles? Because I think there's a different, there's a slight nuance that's been used. So I'm going to start with you, Shannon. How is that defined? Um, I mean, to me, just when I, when I think of the term white supremacy, I mean, to me, it's just the idea that uh, whiteness, white culture, which again, um, living in a culture that is predominantly um, white, and I mean that in, not in terms of the actual bodies on the ground, but I mean that in terms of um, what is um, seen as normal, right? Mm -hmm. What is what we feel like we don't have to talk about, just the everyday assumptions, especially around values, right? What's valued, what has space, what has cultural currency, what gets seen. Um, all those things um, to me are, um, and I think a, a lot of scholars would say that, you know, that's sort of the, the, the baseline understanding um, scholarship that we have. I think in the wider community, mm -hmm. um, what people understand white supremacy as being, it are these very targeted acts of, I would say, extreme violence, um, that, which we're here to talk about, you know, um, in part today, mm -hmm. right? What happened at the fourth precinct um, with the, um, I believe it was two two white men and one Asian American man who who um, shot and hit um, several folks. In fact, one of my students, her cousin, mm -hmm. has a, a, a bullet lodged in his in his stomach mm -hmm. and has to they can't get it out and has to have um, his had to have his um, colon, I believe, and part of his small intestine taken out because of this since 19 years old. So. Um, yeah, and charged with, I think, riding. Like, right, right. So, I mean, we'll get into this. We'll get into this. But um, so I think that that, to me, is the disjunction that that I understand anyway. I, I, I want to hear what uh, Peter and, and Keith have to say about this as well. But that's really the, dis, the uh, dis, disjunction and the distinction that I understand between um, the community sort of understanding of white supremacy as, again, this sort of targeted, um, incidents of racial violence versus the the scholarly understanding which is sort of like white supremacy is the air that we breathe it's the land that we're standing on it's the language that we speak it's 
every every aspect really of American life because that's what America um, was built on. Um, I'm going to turn it to Keith. Sure. Uh, that's a very good question. I, I would say that the the term white supremacy is not often used outside of the academy. I'm hard pressed to hear people say those two words together, uh, white and supremacy. But when we talk about it in the academy, it just means the the social, the political, and economic domination uh, of whites over over people of color, over women, over others who are marginalized. And oftentimes, that when you look at how white supremacy is manifested structurally, that means that you and you look at the policy level. That means that whites historically have had a tendency to exclude, not only dominate, not only take land, not only enslave, but to exclude people of color and other marginalized folks uh, outside, uh, out of the systems of uh, in United States society, out of the institutions of United States society. That's how we define it. And then the perpetuation of that over time uh, means that it's still, it's still present, although it may be slightly uh, invisible or may not be as visible as it was let's say in the 18th century so we can see uh, the manifestations of enslavement we can see uh, uh, with the history of Jim Crow segregation kind of the manifest uh, visible uh, palpable white supremacy uh, in society but now it's been rendered more invisible it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist it still exists uh, but I would say that it's a word that you don't hear outside of the walls of the academy. And if you do, people sort of make it synonymous with racism, white racism, with prejudice. KKK. Uh, KKK. Like white nationalism. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's yeah. not the same. So when, we, when I hear that word, that's, that's, the, that's the strongest condemnation that you can render against the system. When you say white supremacy, Malcolm X, he used the term white world supremacy. He said it's the domination of white people over the planet. <laughs> you know, he didn't limit it to the United States. Uh, which meant that yeah, you looked at subjects, whether they be people of color subjects, women and others, what you define as, as uh, white oppression in the United States, you can find that in other parts of the world. Uh, you can find it in the Caribbean, South America, in Africa, in Asia, in Europe. It didn't matter where, you know, wherever whites were, wherever whites went. Uh, or white can, capital. Or, or white, white capital went. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm traveling to Africa, right? And that that it's associated with capital. I mean, you, you don't have to have white bodies to have whites. Oh, well, absolutely, right? absolutely. Mm -hmm. But but the the, the beginnings of, of whites uh, moving away from the continent of Europe to save Europe. And they saved Europe on the backs <coughs> of those outside of Europe right. um, when they took land and when they enslaved. So that's what I think about when I, when I hear the word white supremacy. Right. I don't know if you need this, Peter. I don't think so. No, no. no. Go ahead. So I, um, I would concur with both Shannon and Keith, but I want to add another nuance. And, uh, and drawing on the work of uh, David Rodiger, who used to teach at UMIN. Uh, and uh, in 1991, David published a book called The Wages of Whiteness. Mm -hmm. and, and David really opened up, I think, two very important areas uh, for us to consider. One is, and as Keith says about the discourse outside the academy, when people talk about race, they usually think they're talking about people of color. Right. If it's race, well, it must be about people of color. Right. David insisted that if we were going to talk about race, we also had to talk about the race that white people have. That, that white people have a race too. So, so that was one, I think, breakthrough. The other was that white supremacy, or what David called whiteness, and Shannon used the term too, um, is also a way that class relations among white people are mediated through white supremacy. And what do you and, mean when you say the word mediated? Yeah, so that so the relations between white workers and white employers is worked through by the presence of workers of color. Mm -hmm. So um, the idea that immigrants take jobs that Americans won't, don't want. And, and David played around and still does with the concept that most of the time when we use the word American, the, the, it has an invisible adjective. Uh, white. Um, and so he said, well, these are jobs that Americans don't want. 
Um, or, as has been the case in, in much of the history of labor in the United States, that employers have threatened and at times used strike breakers or replacements who come from communities of color when white workers themselves are uh, challenging, uh, challenging power and trying to organize or trying to strike. And uh, depending on where we go with our conversation, there are some very interesting examples here in Minnesota of, of how that has played out. So there are ways, and, and I wrote my dissertation on uh, Richmond, Virginia in the era after the Civil War. And, and one of the things that I found was that white workers in Richmond earned about 30% less than their counterparts in New York or Chicago or Pittsburgh or Philadelphia. But they were also making twice what African Americans in their own community made for the same job. So the employer said, aren't you lucky? Look how much more you make uh, than the colored folks in the language of the 19th century. And of course, it was a lot less than their counterparts were making in the North, but the idea was <clears throat> you were supposed to accept, again, what David called the wages of whiteness, um, which is more than people of color, but in fact, less than human beings really should claim uh, and stand up for. With that in mind, going back to the history that all of you can address, my next question is, what is the history of white supremacists in Minnesota? And what is it about the state which has such a liberal reputation that allows this group to fester? I'm gonna let these two gentlemen. Um, <laughs> I, I have plenty to say, but I'm gonna let them, especially historians. Right. Yeah, and then I will conclude. Okay. I, I would say that Given that I love the way you phrased the question because there is a long tradition of white progressive progressivism in this state, right? I mean, it's probably I always tell my students that if you want to find the most radical of whites in U.S. history, you want to look in the upper Midwest because you'll find them: Wisconsin, Minnesota. But you also have to be mindful of the fact that of that whites. Um, are, are not a monolith in any kind of way, so that the, the real uh, serious, um, vicious uh, white racism that we see manifest in the U.S. South also has historically manifested in this region as well. So you can have uh, progressive uh, whites uh, working in the labor movement in the 1920s and 30s, but you could also get the Duluth lynchings that mm -hmm. occur at the same time, right? So that's that double history. Would you mind explaining that just a little bit for those who may not know that history, a good snapshot history of what happened with the Duluth? So the Duluth lynchings took place in 1920. I always, always get the year 20, 20. okay. Was Which was, it was a traveling show that, uh, that crisscrossed the, the country, but uh, they also had a performance <coughs> in Duluth. And there were some African Americans who were accused of raping a white women, and the, the accusation about black men raping white women uh, was always something that was used as a justification for killing blacks, particularly black males. And of course, the great Ida B. Wells did her research and, and uncovered that that was bunk. But that, that was used uh, to kill these, uh, these three men in 1920. And, and they were not even residents, they were just passing through. But also, the 1920s and the 1930s signals one of the, the, one of the greatest uh, transformations uh, in the labor movement particularly on the Democratic side of the electoral politics ledger, right? Because to be DFL was to be something quite radical. And those who led the way would be a lot of Minnesota, white Minnesotans, right? Leading all the way up to Hubert Humphrey. Hubert Humphrey, is, it was even more radical before Humphrey became mayor of Minneapolis and then became a senator because he purged the communists and a lot of leftists out of the Democratic Party. So it's so DFL, Democrat Farm Labor, was really, really white radical stuff. That's Minnesota's history. But it doesn't mean that you have a lot of white Minnesotans who, who thought that, although that could be the region's political tradition, that may not be mine personally, so I will engage in these kind of acts, and then I will also engage in acts of exclusion. I'm always uh, uh, reminded how, how palpable racism was. I read uh, some of the black newspapers in the 1940s, and blacks can't go to Calhoun Beach. Mm -hmm. yeah. Blacks can't go downtown. Mm -hmm. you, know, you go downtown, go to Calhoun Beach. Now you see all kinds of people. There was a time where blacks could not crisscross the, the Twin Cities public sphere. Mm -hmm. 
uh, in, in public places because whites did the same thing that they did in other parts of the country, particularly the U.S. South. So that's that dual legacy. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are many instances of, of, of white folks being on both sides of the divide in this. And it's, so it, it, it seems unusual mm -hmm. because you do have this tradition uh, around radical politics here in, this, right. in the state. Right. So one is Edina. Oh, God. Yeah. And, and he talks about how, in fact, Edina started out as a racially mixed community. And that as it became incorporated into Minneapolis system as a, as a more exclusive suburb, that African Americans began to be pushed out. And that Edina becomes white uh, by the 40s and, and stays white until relatively recently. The other example, which is very painful to me, uh, is Austin, Minnesota, a place of great working class militancy and radicalism. And in, in 1933, Austin was the site of the very first sit-down strike in the United States at the Hormel Meatpacking Plant. And I celebrated that in a book I wrote. Now he comes on and says, ah, but in 1922, so the very same era as the Duluth lynching that Keith has referenced, in 1922, there was a nationwide strike of workers who repaired railroad trains, called the Railroad Shopman Strike. And the strike was broken across the country by the importation of African American strike breakers from the South. And so what, what had happened in the South was that African Americans had gained the skills of doing the machinist work, the molders work, the electricians work, of repairing these trains, uh, but they were paid radically substandard wages. Suddenly, this is the era of the Great Migration, that first great wave of African Americans coming north, and some of these employers recruited them to come and be strike breakers. Austin was one of the places. There was a large railroad shop, and what the employers often did in those days is when they brought strike breakers, they actually housed them in the place where they worked. They put up cots. It was a way to avoid conflict crossing picket lines. And, and there they were. And a mob organized in Austin, led by workers from the Hormel plant, the very same workers who would have this great sit-down strike 11 years later. Um, and, uh, and they attacked the railroad roundhouse where the strike breakers were being housed. And they, and they ran out the back that was on the Cedar River, and they tried to swim across the Cedar River uh, to, to get to safety. And, it, and to this day, an unknown number of them drowned. No one was ever punished uh, for this. And no one ever, even the authorities never even felt like they had to give an actual accounting of how many people had died. Um, and so for me, a lot of my work since I discovered that has been how do I explain that contradiction mm -hmm. between the militancy of the sit-down strike of 33 and this virulent, violent racism in, in 1922. And I think that that's like, the, for me as a labor historian, the great paradox of white workers' history in the United States. And it's been right here in, in Minnesota as well. Right? And, and I just also want to say too that, I mean, I, I think it's, we also have to go back to the founding of the state go for it. it's itself you know and so I mean when we had the you know 150 year celebration and you know and there was a lot of tension you know if you were paying attention <laughs> between a lot of you know uh, native communities and um, uh, which are very very active and even myself as a as a worker as an academic worker and and a lot of the frustrations that i personally have in that capacity as a, a vocal progressive black woman faculty worker um and just asking myself again why do i not feel this great you know i feel some kind of uh, affinity affection i get some kind of energy from union history but i don't get a lot Right, and mm. and that's not by accident. Yeah. Why is that? Right, like that again has to do with um, a lot of um, the the sort of um, buried underneath um, history that you're talking about. Right, with that, that was a very interesting 
um, story that you told. Very troubling, yeah. but I think emblematic of a lot of the, the, the tensions and the, the buried stories that sort of undergird, like, why do I not feel comfortable in this space, right? right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a history um, that is res responsible for that feeling, right? That we don't get, that uh, so much of labor history is about, um, and so much of American labor in this country has been about working class white men, right? And, Excluding and, black workers. And, yes. and other and, folks, and, and native yes, folks, and right. you know, Hormel now, right? right. Huge uh, Latino population right. there. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and outstate Minnesota, of course, you know, there's also a lot of Micronesian, you know, communities as well in a lot of these working class areas. So, I mean, I, I, I think that, um, yeah, the, the real um, problem, if you will, is um, what do we, and I felt this when I moved here in Minnesota, you know, 12 years ago, and I feel like it's all kind of coming to a head right mm -hmm. now. It takes a while sometimes. But, you know, when we said, when we, you know, white working class Minnesota said, um, we're progressive and we're going to be, you know, for the everyday worker, the everyday person. But we, when we said everyday person, when we said person, we didn't mean you, right? Like <laughs> that definition of who constitutes a person. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what we have to get to, mm -hmm. who counts as a person. And so <clears throat> Native, Native Americans, you know, and the land that we, that doesn't count as a person, right? We're not talking about you when we're talking about like making a state and statehood and founding a civilization and using the land. We're not talking about you when we're talking about black workers. We're not talking about you when we're talking about women. We're not talking about you when we're talking about, you know, um, queer folks who, you know, can express who they are freely, you know, in the working place or any place else, right? So I, I think that that is really what I, I feel and I have felt since coming here, you know, and I, I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which by no stretch of the imagination is like this like perfect place. But I, it's such a difference when I go back home because I feel like a lot of those tensions and enmity and you know the nuances, I, I feel like they're just out there. And I mm -hmm. think that has to do with the fact that there has been a, a black middle class there. It hasn't been perfect. Again, there's been a ton of, of white flight you know, all to the suburbs from Detroit and, and Ann Arbor in some ways is, is um, emblematic of that but I feel like here there's it's like this subterranean yeah. mm. like people mm -hmm. are pretending that what's going on is not going on until right. we have these ruptures like the fourth precinct you know and then subsequent ruptures yeah. that mm -hmm. happen after that if that makes sense oh it makes perfect sense um, let me circle back with a um, follow-up question which is <coughs> I feel like when, because I'm from Toledo, Ohio. Oh, so, yeah, Toledo, uh, yeah. Yep, 45 so, minutes, yeah. Yep. So, um, and my parents come from the South, so we're talking about up South generation. When we think of the North, when I was, when we've constructed it, when we talk amongst family and talk amongst the community, this part, this upper Midwest doesn't figure into that imagination. Um, it's kind of like the, like the Western boundary would be Illinois. The southern boundary would be Texas. And all of this is like Illinois, Chicago, another world, California. Right. That's kind of how it's configured. Yes. And so why is that? And how does that configure into what's going on with white supremacists still kind of feeling? Because I feel like there's something that says to them, yeah, come on over here. Whereas in Toledo, when we had our white supremacists, the young gang members came in and said, you're not, you need to leave our town right now, and we've yet to have another problem. <laughs> <laughs> so what's going on here that still kind of says, yeah, come on, even though we have this raw progressive history, da, 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 what's, what's, come, what's that, too, and how does that configure, how does that imagination configure into this? So the first thing I would offer is uh, the role that uh, massive black migration yes. um, played mm -hmm. in shaping uh, Toledo, yeah. Detroit, yeah. Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, yeah. Chicago, um, and 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 indeed what you just described as this kind of blank space mm -hmm. is 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 an area that that there was not a massive. African American migration to. There was to California, right. you know, and, and again, you know, 
my recommendation, look at uh, Isabel Wilkerson's The Warmth oh, of Other Suns, which is a fantastic book. And, and, and you know, and, and she interviewed almost 900. It's such an amazing. It is. She interviewed over 900 people and then built a book on four family stories and how she figured out which four fa Ain't none of them came, came <laughs> to this part of the country. Right. One went to California, and others went to up the East Coast. <laughs> And, and, and it really is left out. And so some of it was the, the massive industry uh, that had labor needs and labor needs that were disrupted by World War I. Um, and so African Americans were, like most migrants and immigrants, they were very practical. You go where you know you can get a job. You don't go where you don't know what's going to happen. Um, and so there was a call for labor in uh, steel mills and auto factories and tire factories and and so they went to those places. So I think that, that you know then there are many many good studies that tell us how they built capacity in those communities Lee. and people had to deal with them. What do you Political mean capacity? Power, okay. Right. They built institutions, uh, churches, social organizations, newspapers, news, newspapers cultural institutions, and on the top of that, they built political voice. And they had to be dealt with. People didn't necessarily have to like them, but they had to deal with them. And, and here, you know, to some degree, African Americans were kind of under the radar here in, in Minnesota and, you know, go to Denver or, you know, other places in the region. And, and you know, racism, white supremacy is a very complicated thing you know is it um, because there are times where well if there aren't a lot of people of color around the white people kind of tolerate them and they're not a threat mm -hmm. but then there are ways that when the when things get bad then they're vulnerable whereas maybe they're always a threat but they're too powerful to mess with or at least to mess with in certain ways and and so I think that one of the things that years ago I had a student who did a project looking at the relationship of cultural create creativity in the Twin Cities and Chicago. Mm -hmm. And found that the Twin Cities became, and he took Prince as his primary example, the Twin Cities became a place for crossover music. That if you were a person of color and you wanted to make a living as a musician, you needed to figure out how to create music that white people would listen to. And he found that any number of other Afri great African-American musicians who grew up here moved to Chicago because they wanted to make kinds of music that needed a, a larger black audience to make it sustainable uh, as a career. They moved to Chicago. And I think there were similar things with uh, people who got involved with newspapers, uh, people who became political spokespeople, there was a way that, that, that Chicago also drew people away um, because there was more of a base there. So I think it, it's this double-edged sword of kind of being tolerated because you're not threatening, um, but then being vulnerable when, because I think that part of the whiteness thing is, is that you have to pay attention to white people. Yeah. It ain't about anything that people of color do. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's Native Americans and, and taking their land away or lynching, mm -hmm. 36 of them in Mankato right, or right, right. What, what, whatever the, it may, it's, it's, we have to ask what's going on with the white people that makes them want to act that way. Right. That it's not precipitated by the people of color, it's what's going on with the white people. And so if there isn't much going on with the white people, then it's not so problematic to have some people of color around. When there is a depression or a fight for jobs or some kind of crisis and and, and they're looking for a safety valve for their emotion and their anger, then suddenly, oh, people of color are a vulnerable target. If they're a certain mass and are organized to a certain degree, then the white people are not going to pick them as a target. And, and so I think that that's what's created this, and, and even to go back where we started, this kind of veneer of, I mean, you know, we haven't used the word Minnesota nice yet, but, yeah, but, that's what but this kind of veneer yeah, yeah. of yeah. tolerance yeah. Yeah. And then this powder keg yep. that's, un that's underneath it. But I would just, just add briefly to your, t uh, I say, I'm going to call it a Toledo, um, an implicit Toledo, Ohio question yes. uh, about, uh, <laughs> about those three yeah. white men and that one Asian <coughs> who was yeah. shot. And the reason why she's asking, I'm from New York City. I'm born and raised in Harlem. Mm 
So when I heard the story, I'm like, ain't no fucking way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that would go down. So right, right. Four, yeah. four, well, three Asian women. Yeah. yeah. Well, when it came right. to Harlem right. and shot some black kids yeah. in the middle of a protest. No. And I'm like, well, where are we? Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, so right. Uh, nobody should <laughs> asking the question right. because. The first thing I thought about was how did that uh, actually go down? And then they, I heard they lured them away from the yeah. from the four priests in protest yeah. and then shot them. So, two things I, I, I take two things quickly. I know you may go back to that question. The boldness of, of the three whites and the one Asian, and the mere fact that these young black men were asleep because there's no way I'm walking down the street with right. with, with three or four white dudes right. Right. telling me to come somewhere I want to talk to you in the middle of a protest. <laughs> so I think that's part of the Minnesota that, right. that, that right. they are describing, right. Peter and Shannon, that right. you, you just don't know sometimes what you're dealing with mm -hmm. when it comes to race. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, any? Um, and I, I just want to say too that I, I think those of us who are also black but from other places, I, I mean, we, we feel like Black people are different here. Yeah. Like, I hear that all the time from people, right? And I think, you know, it, it, it is this, like, cultural re-education because, um, I mean, I think this is changing, I would say, for the better, um, personally, because I think that um, part of it is, like, it's just a very, every place has a very particular yes. history, right? And right. a very particular culture. And the culture here, which I think makes it, really a vibrant fascinating place to live in is that there there are um a lot of uh somali uh mm -hmm. like the particular flavor of blackness here right. is different than it is right. in a place like toledo right mm -hmm. like uh, uh, southeastern lower michigan detroit right it's, it's right. different than it is in harlem right Definitely. new york right chicago right it's 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 very different right and um and then you know you then you have folks from you know um, not Chicago but Gary right, right. and you know like Indian just in Indiana <laughs> right and all these places right who are coming here because there is this social safety net here or has been right right um, <laughs> right um, traditionally where there's not right but it was for me 12 years when I came here I kept on encountering these sort of to me. I would call them weird black people between me and my three black friends right here that we were like cool together, right? Where it was sort of like this thing where they were socialized to be the only black person right. in the room mm -hmm. and they were rewarded for that, mm -hmm. right? I'm seeing all this nodding from the black folks here, <laughs> right? We all know this this phenomenon, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you try to just be like, hey, what's up, how are you, you know, whatever, like, you know, bomb with them culturally or another just way. Just socially. Just socially, like they look at you, like, especially in front of white people, they look at you like. Don't don't interrupt my flow. Yeah, yeah, like just, you know. <laughs> don't do that. And that is a very particular Minnesota dynamic, right? Like of blackness where it's sort of this thing where it's like, well, we can deal with whiteness you know, we can deal with it with one person, but we can't deal with it with more. And then the fact that black people and people of color can enact white supremacy as well. Yes. Like it doesn't mm -hmm. require you to have a white body to perpetuate that. And so I think that's also something that mm -hmm. we need to acknowledge and talk about. Right on. The sister in the back is very, <laughs> <laughs> you have hands going up already. Okay. Well, give me, give me. <laughs> Hold on, give me last, give uh, like the last part of it. We got you. Okay. All right. We'll keep that question. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, so let's talk about how the switching a little bit. How has white supremacists changed from the 20th to the 21st <clears throat> century? How has that morphed, um, mutated? How? I would say the thing that's first coming to mind, and I really want to hear you gentlemen because I know you're gonna have a lot of great things to say about this but for me as I'm not a millennial we'll put that out there but um, as a Gen Xer who now you know is totally immersed in this digital environment I think that we have to acknowledge that there is this whole I was on this panel with I don't know if you guys know Steven Saleda but um, yeah. he's a, a Palestinian American professor who um, you know there's always tensions going on between um, the, the Palestinian and, and, and Israeli um, uh, forces. And this was last year, and he put out some tweets. Um, yes. And he almost 
Uh, no, they they he lost, he, lost he lost his job. They offered, they actually offered him University of Illinois um, at uh, Urbana Champaign had already made an offer um, to him to be on their faculty, and they actually it went all the way up the chain to like the vice provost and whatever, and they actually rescinded it. Right, because and it came out later that like the donors were scared and blah blah, and they were putting pressure and all this stuff. He sued them and won, um, and now is at the University of, of he's doing really well. He's got two book contracts. He's like you know whatever. You know it's like one of those like um, stories that you don't hear very often where right. it's a happy ending. Um, but I was on a panel with him. Um, on academic repression, because I also got my butt kicked uh, here, yes. um, and that's another thing that we don't have to talk about at, at length here. But um, um, I've I've written about it and all this stuff. Yes. But um, so I, I I just I bring that up to say that he and I were talking in our on our panel about how there is this whole apparatus, mm -hmm. this digital apparatus um, of white supremacy mm -hmm. of young Republicans at, especially on campuses, mm -hmm. right, that will like infiltrate, you know, somebody will send out, you know, a tweet or somebody will send out an email or somebody will post on Facebook, like this professor said X, Y, Z, P, D, Q, and this professor was discriminatory against white males. This black female professor, right. you know, was discriminatory against white males, like we need to, whatever. And I got on, I think, like one listserv. Yeah, you got on here. And I got, and I, and, um, uh, like a bunch of KKK organizations, like mm -hmm. were like flooding my inbox, yep. and I even got like you know um, uh, actual snail mail mm -hmm. like at the at my, at the school at MCTC, and um, and so they are able. I think I think that this is an important distinction yes. versus you know now the 21st century versus the 20th century. Now they are able to mobilize quicker, mm -hmm. more effectively, right, and get a base moving. Right, um, with such precision and accuracy, mm -hmm. and Steven Saleda was saying that the same thing is happening to him. Was happening to you know a young black female professor at University of Memphis yep. who also had some tweets and that were you know suspect because she was you know critiquing white supremacy. Right, and so I I think we just have to acknowledge that mm -hmm. that that's a factor as well. Versus the twentieth century where um, there's this, speaking of books to recommend, uh, there's a really great book called Blood in the Face. Um, Ku Klux Klan, Neo-Nazis, and Rising New White Culture by journalist James Ridgway he used to be part of the Village Voice, where he said that now, back back in the 20th century, which was 15 some odd years ago. Which we were born in. Right. Um, <laughs> he was saying how the KKK, at first they were all kind of like their own units, but then after a while, they all started connecting. So neo-Nazis connected with the Klan, which right. connected with the Aryan Brotherhood. Right. Right. And so I think that carried over, you know, pieces like Stormfront, yeah. that kind of carried over into the 21st century, add the digital, yeah. add, the, um, add the young Republicans, and Hillary Clinton saying there's a vast right-wing conspiracy, which we all need to apologize to her for because she was right, right. Um, ultimately. Yeah. <laughs> but that idea of the, uh, the speed of it was also set back um, the base was set in the 20th century. It just became yeah. precise right. in the 21st century. Yeah. Yeah. Gentlemen. I, I would say that the, the way in which they use technology is certainly new. But I always teach my students that there's something called a, a counter, a revolution, whether it be for marginalized people. And that is always a white counter revolution. Yes. There's yes. a revolution, a counter revolution. In U.S. history, one thing that you can always guarantee <laughs> is that whites will fight back. Yeah. Fight back the gains that people make, mm -hmm. right? So people just want to think that the Civil Rights Movement was this great watershed moment in American history, and it was, and that we have arrived. But I always tell my students, look for ways that whites will respond to your advancement. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so what we're seeing now is that uh, whites have always uh, tried to uh, figure out a way to respond, one of the ways in which they, to me it's the same, I don't think there's a, there's a carryover from the 20th century to the 21st, meaning that they may have actually united in mm -hmm. terms of white hate groups, right. they use technology uh, different, maybe even better, um, but I think where I have a problem with us, I think the, the going back to one of the things that Peter said, that the progressive left has failed. Yes marginalized people because the progressive that. left yes. has gone to sleep yes. mm -hmm. and I mean yep. the entire left I mean all of those who are marginalized uh, and even even uh, progressive whites now here this is why I say fail we are 
in mainstream American politics, we're scared to use the L word, liberal. We've retreated from that. People did beat up on Hillary Clinton when she said the vast white ring, uh, white, uh, vast right wing conspiracy. Absolutely, they they sort of push back on that. Now I have problems with uh, those who are in power, like the Clintons and, uh, and, and others. But when we talk about movement, there's that means something different. There uh, there are movements of, of marginalized people, whether it be people of color, or queer folk, women. But there are, there's also a broader movement that we are partaking, which is called the progressive left. I always tell my students, who gave you the eight-hour day? Right. Mm -hmm. I have to say, well, the labor movement gave you that, right? But the labor, labor movement was part of a larger movement that included other people. That particular wing in American politics has got to respond to the forces of the right, uh, oh, I can't say that word, the right, right wing, wing. <laughs> because, because I think in many ways we are losing this battle. Right. That the that American politics, politics has become more, much more centrist. Uh, what, what we see with Donald Trump is not an accident, mm. that he's tapped into something, and he's only tapped into something because what was invisible is now visible, yeah. mm -hmm. and white people feel that they can say what they want to say. Uh, they've been doing it for years on the blogosphere yep. and some really nasty stuff that you see on the internet. But now we are publicly saying it yeah. as, as white folks. And we are you know, engaging in, in acts of mob, white mob violence in, on, on the north side in black neighborhoods. So I think that this is where we're at a critical juncture yes. of the progressive left because if we don't respond to that, that's why I always get a reporter who, who want to ask, what do you think about Black Lives Matter? I'm like, let them young people continue to do what they're doing. I may have some personal problems as a scholar. I will never say that publicly <laughs> in front of a camera. I won't let you know what problems I have with, oh, what do you think about the tactics? I said, first of all, I study all kind of tactics, the civil rights movement, sit-ins, lions. I ain't never heard of a tactic of getting in front of marathon runners, crossing a finish line. I had never heard of that. I said, that's, dude, what do you mean? I said, that's brilliant. I said, I said, because oh, marathon runners, those are some of the most hardcore. <laughs> they, I mean, you will get some attention if you do that. The major attention, international. Right. So I said, wait a minute now, these young people are really thinking outside the box. So, yes, so the fair to state fair, the, um, all of America, I thought all of those were great, but of course, older folks think that that's we, that they should engage in those kind of tactics, right? But I think that we need to allow these young people to actualize themselves within that movement and continue to do the work of, of advancing the cause because we want well, the Generation Xers, don't I always say Generation X was asleep, mm -hmm. yeah. right? I'm part of Generation X. I have never seen this kind of ferment in the last 10, 20, 30 years. I, I think this is great, yeah. right? But we could critique it in terms of the ways in which they use the strategies, but again, we should not publicly come out. So that story that came out in NPR about from Keith Ellison and Babington and uh, Betsy Hodges saying that these folks should not pack up and leave and don't come back. The only way that Betsy Hodges got in front of a microphone was because of Black Lives Matter. Right. right. Yeah. That's how she got in front of the podium. If it wasn't for the movement, she wouldn't have stepped in front of the podium to address the issue. Okay. I can go on and on. <laughs> <laughs> right, and we need to go on, so let me ask this. Look. Let me ask the next question. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Um, so, and it's, um, you might, uh, well, I'll start off with you. Okay. What were the state's reactions? We kind of addressed this a little bit, but what have been the state's reactions to white supremacists? If we're talking marches we're talking how what was what did that look like when these when these white supremacists have flared up well i i think that uh i mean first to go back to keith's mm -hmm. point about responsive black lives matter the fact that what we heard from governor dayton when when mm -hmm. black lives matter wanted to march on the fair right you know oh he you know the, the, i mean it was violating what Shannon is describing exactly. as the implicit agreement about how we're supposed to be, white people, black people, other people here in Minnesota, mm -hmm. that they were violating some sort, which they had never been party to sign <laughs> any agreement. But, right. And then we heard from, from the police chief and Betsy Hodges, again, a very similar, 
you know, oh, we feel your issue, yes. you know, but, you know, so, you know, I think that the government's response has often been about maintaining the implicit agreement that, uh, to some degree, the millennials were never part of right. making. Yeah. To some degree, African Americans and others who have moved here were never part of making. Um, and a lot of people, these things got made, as, as Karl Marx would say about history, it, it got made behind people's backs. Right. And then, and now suddenly, the government is going to enforce the the status quo. The respectability uh, politics. The res thank that's, that's, really that's, 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 that's really that's what it term. is. It's this idea, respectability politics, right? It's this idea that, you know, you hear it all the time, like Don Lemon, you know, and uh, yeah, all these <laughs> folks who were sort of like, if you just pull up your your, draw. your draws, and <laughs> black, and young black men, young black boys, you'd graduate high school, you wouldn't be, you know, getting, you know, beat up on the streets by the police. You wouldn't be, you know, getting expelled from school if you just pulled up your drawers, right? And this idea that it's somehow by being respectable, quote unquote, by um, abiding by like the, what we would maybe term them like white codes of conduct, um, white, I should say, upper middle class codes of conduct, um, you will then be uh, miraculously seen as valid as a human being. Um, or as a human being just like uh, white upper class men are seen as human beings. Um, that is... Though the, they can have their own draws done and whatnot. Right, right, <laughs> exactly. Um, that is the argument which many times is implicit. It is, in other words, it is not stated, right? And so, um, and so people have come back, which I think is brilliant, with like memes on the internet of like, <laughs> you know, um, Martin Luther King, like, you know, just getting his ass kicked by the police, like he's got this four-piece suit on, you know, he's all dressed, you know, it's like this stuff has not helped. Like, you, you can be as respectable as you want to be, and the moment that you show yourself as not aligned with white supremacy, um, whiteness, white institutions, or whatever, I mean, you become vulnerable. So that, that phrase, uh, respectability politics, sort of encompasses yeah. that entire argument. Right. That's great. I don't know any politician roll out of bed and give people social rights. I've never seen that. <laughs> Any, any history book that I've read. They just don't do it. They have to be forced to do it. Right. I mean, it's just as simple as that. Right. All right. Um, let me um, ask this next question. So Minnesota has a recent history of being a destination for refugees, in part because many of the charitable organizations, um, such as the Volex, mm -hmm. um, are in the state. Does this trend counter, how does this trend, if it does, run counter to the state's white supremacist mentality or feed into it? And if so, how? It feeds into the state's paternalist yes. um, mentality. Yeah. I mean, and paternalism, again, this idea of this noble white father who's gonna take care of the yeah. little uncivilized um, brown and native folks mm -hmm. who, you know, whatever you want to say, haven't found God, haven't found... Um, the code yet. Yeah, and you know, or haven't found civilization, et cetera. Um, and so I think that, you know, while we can say that there are plenty of aspects of that phenomenon and that history um, that, that are noble and, you know, are compassionate, um, there are also a lot of aspects of it that are deeply, deeply problematic, and even, I would say, violent. How so? Um, this idea that, um, or even also just not well thought out. I mean, okay. you, you go to some of these immigrant communities and, you know, sort of people just brought here, like, you know, Hmong folks just sort of brought here, dropped, you know, um, mm -hmm. in these communities that weren't prepared um, for them to house them, weren't prepared for, um, the uh, influx of new folks into the school. You know, you go right. to I've talked to Roosevelt High School. Tensions going on there between the African American and Somali students. You know, the Minneapolis Public Schools was not and is not still prepared mm -hmm. to educate um, those two groups on their histories. You know, and the students knew that, and they know that. They know right. it's wrong. They were like, we never have the opportunity to learn about each other. So of course, I'm going to ask. You know, my. You know. Um, I'm going to ask Abdul, like, oh, did you grow up in a tree? Like, did you whatever? And he's going to get really pissed and, right. like, come up, walk up on me. And, of course, I'm going to be like, you know, 
yo, 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 you know, like doing like really problematic, you know, caricatures of African Americans because I don't, and you know, I mean, my husband's Liberian. I know a lot of the like problematic ideas that African immigrants have about, about, you know, like, oh, well, you don't have any culture, you know, you, mm. you know, and, um, and they're not going to say that, but that has a lot to do with the fact that we are descendants of slaves, right? And, and so, I mean, the, there's all this stuff that the infrastructure, when you bring people, it's not that you shouldn't bring people out of, you know, these really, you know, problematic situations like the, the Syrian refugees and whatever. Yes, bring them, but make sure that they have then the infrastructure to then succeed um, uh, on their own cultural terms, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so there, there is this way of also assimilation, you right. know, that that's that there's this expectation too that's not necessarily explained to people, right? They're fleeing the war-torn um, countries, war-torn situations, refugee camps. I mean, just really difficult um, situations, right? And we don't expect them that. Um, we don't prepare them for the, the vast whiteness and, the, and, and um, the, all the different institutions um, that they're going to have to <clears throat> make their way through. And even the tensions that they're going to feel with the people who historically <coughs> have been here, who are people of color um, and have been marginalized in a lot of the same ways that they're getting marginalized, but it's also different, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's also a lot of the tensions that I see. Um, between um, newly immigrant um, marginalized communities and then like historically marginalized communities? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think the, there's a long history of, of the Volags in Minnesota, Catholic Charities, Lutheran Social Services being two of, of bringing in and resettling uh, immigrants, uh, starting with European immigrants and then uh, after World War II, uh, starting with a lot of folks of color recently in the 90s with. Uh, uh, refugees, uh, people of color from, from different parts of the uh, uh, African and Asian continents. Uh, I would say, inter well, here's an interesting side note. So, Minneapolis and St. Paul, damn near 50% people of color mm -hmm. in a very historically white state. Mm -hmm. That would not have happened unless we had, we right. brought all these folks right. in. Yes. Right. So, it yeah. has definitely yes. uh, made blacker and browner. Yes. The Twin Cities, not necessarily the metro area, although many of them are moving to suburbs, right. suburban communities, but certainly, can you imagine mm -hmm. Minneapolis, St. Paul, they have 50% people of color. So Peter talked about right. this community being right. completely transformed. Mm -hmm. right. uh, that has a lot to do with that history. But I would say that much of the resettlement, is, is it, it's an incomplete, um, uh, job, but a lot of it is tied to money. Uh, Minnesota is one of the states that it, it, it always step to the, steps to the forefront where there's a crisis in the world, and it says that we will bring folks in because you have a political uh, structure uh, that's national and local, yeah. right? Folks in, in the United States Congress who represent Minnesota, uh, senators that say that we want to resettle and we want the dollars, we want the money. Mm. And Catholic Charities and Lutheran Social Services, they do a lot of good work, but they are yeah. in the position to do the work because of all of the millions and dollars that they're able and to tap And we call that into. the nonprofit industrial the complex. complex. Well, absolutely, yeah. right? There's <laughs> a lot of money at stake. Right? Yeah. So, one C3s. And so, you know, again, again, there's another dual legacy of, of Minnesota doing some great things, all, albeit paternalistic, um, but <laughs> with, with, and it does have a tendency to drop people off. You know, it gives gives these families a couple of couple of dollars, uh, maybe some transportation money. Uh, maybe they may, yeah, wish them maybe a, an apartment, and that's it. These folks got to fend for themselves after that. And they're, I mean, even my, my still teach at the U. So my, many of my students are, are they come from um, refugee communities, uh, push push factors out of the Sudan or. or uh, other parts, and it's they tell me these stories, and the stories are horrible. They bounce around, they've lived in maybe 10 different places before they actually settled in Minnesota. Uh, so, uh, I think that there's a that's part of that longer history of Minnesota progressivism, mm -hmm. the, the Volags, right? Starting with the Swedes and the Norwegians, and uh, you know, settling even some Japanese uh, Americans who were interned, right? Uh, was, uh, but, but, and then, and then, of course, the Hmong. The Hmong is the big first wave of, of refugees of color, uh, and then that opened up the door to African refugees in the 90s. Um, so it's it's a problematic uh, story, uh, but I think that it's one that we need to. I, mean, I think it needs to be part of a larger Black Lives 
and Brown Lives Movement. We always talk about real local issues that need to be talked about and dealt with, but the stuff that happens to, to black refugees and brown refugees is probably extremely problematic. Okay. So I would, would also add uh, to again uh, refer to Dave Rodiger's work. Dave, Dave wrote a book called uh, Working Towards Whiteness uh, that looked at uh, northern, western, European, and southern, central, eastern European immigrants to the U.S. in the late 19th and over the first half of the 20th century, and the ways that Italians and Poles and Jews and Greeks, and Irish, and the ways that they became white. Mm -hmm. right. and, and really ask, you know, it's a, it's a very, very important question, that did you have to participate in racism in mm -hmm. order to pass the test right. that you sense. were that you were now and were, white and were tests. yeah so um, so there's that experience <laughs> to understand and david points out as many many other scholars have pointed out that most of those immigrants were not thought to be white when they first arrived yep. and um, and 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 in many cases did not think of themselves as white they thought of themselves as coming from a particular village and, and how they created and how this new framework was created. But then we have to ask, so now what about the folks that have come since 1965 when the laws changed and the folks mm -hmm. that have come from Central and South America, East Africa, uh, Southeast Asia? Um, because race is never yeah. about phenotype. Phenotype becomes, people see shit that may not even exist. Mm -hmm. They just decide what somebody is, and then they see them a particular way. So you know, so can them? Is the question will the Hmong become white? Is the is the question you know have certain Asian groups because of their success in education or uh, their previous uh, privileges that that they come in and, and they become honorary white people? Is Mexican a race? That, that these are some of the questions that people are asking now. And, and I think what I'm finding on the ground and both the work that we're doing here at the library and I've been very fortunate for the last three years to be teaching once a week uh, at the Roseville Adult Learning Center, 450 newcomers. Um, most, of the, most of the students I'm working with are Karen, some are Latino, um, and, and some are, are still new, newly arrived mom. Um, they are desperately trying to understand American history mm -hmm. because they are not experiencing what they thought. <laughs> right, exactly. You know? yes. And, and, and yes. the question Absolutely. and what I, what I love about them is they have very few screens. Yep. They're very straightforward. And they say stuff like, why are black people mad at me? <laughs> And I think it's such a great opening, and it's painful. Yeah. And they say they, they, they've got some you know, little store on Rice Street, and, and African-American customers come in and, and are hostile. And it's, Why, what did I ever do? Why are they mad at me? And then they will ask, how could some people make other people slaves and live with it? And, and I find I, I have yet to been able to explain it to their satisfaction because they continue to ask this human question, how could one human being do this to another human being and not feel a moral consequence for it? And I, and I wow, you know, that's great. Let's work with this stuff. But they were, and, you know, as you say, they were not prepared right. uh, for, for any of this and, um, and, and so, how do we intervene in ways that they don't play out earlier generations of violence and conflict across communities and, and, and begin to develop new solidarities? And so I, 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 and it is now, we're a majority people of color community in St. Paul and Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Well, we're a majority residents, right? But yes. again, like, right. is it an apartheid system? Like, you have right. to ask, like, who, what do our systems of governance look like? What do our institutions look like in terms of who is making those really important policy decisions at the top? And I just say that 
because I work at a place where everybody calls MCTC sort of like, oh, this is the, the brownest school, mm -hmm. you know, in the state. And I'm like, well, maybe in terms of enrollment, not in terms of student completion, not in terms mm -hmm. of faculty, not in terms of administration, not in terms of staff. Okay, so let me pivot on that. We're talking about um, ideas around infrastructure to help people um, to to help people educate themselves and each other. Let's talk about the media and all of this. So, how does white supremacy manifest in media coverage, and how does that insulate white supremacists? And how do we begin to cover such? How do we begin to counter such coverage? <laughs> <laughs> oh, whoever. Well, just uh, whoever I mean, question. That was a small I, um, question. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No. <laughs> Media means many different things. Yes. I mean, it doesn't mean television, nightly news. But okay. I'm going to start there only because I, I, I don't necessarily get my news from there, but I do have a tendency to come home after a hard day's work and turn on the TV and maybe on the channel, on the news channel. Yeah. But one of the things I, I do see from that standpoint is that a lack, a lack of uh, reporters of color. I've never right. seen anything like this right. before. Right. I mean, you may have one of like black, nobody, nobody. Like, there's like some it's crazy. Endless like it's, supply it's just of young like, white people. Uh, yeah. Endless supply. You would just have Endless one. Of white people. <laughs> I mean, you, you just have like one person of color. <laughs> yes. Like, I mean, you know, like you go nobody. to any place else, and, and although I would say one channel, I saw three in one night. Who's that, that was like overnight. Who was like, that? Oh, of course, the overnights. No, no, no. It was. Um, I figured what station it was, but I saw it like three. What? Like boom, boom, boom. Here? Right, but yeah, yeah, I was like, I was surprised. But the reason why I say that is because of, I've been here 12 years too. I've seen, I've seen nobody on TV. And the stories that they come are never any stories that are significant about communities of color. You just, they'll, you'll see something about crime. They come a lot of shootings here. Yeah. I don't know why. And it's not, I mean, this a, it gives you an impression that a lot of shootings take place here, but in retrospect, when you look at, uh, past history and others, and you look at other cities, um, uh, it's not as many, but they like to cover every single one, yep. it seems like. Yep. I don't yep. know what that's about. Yep. And I know that the movement, they always call out the uh, the reports that seem to be biased toward people of color, uh, or they've been biased uh, in the past. I know a lot of folks don't like, so I won't mention the stations. There are certain, mm -hmm. A lot of movement people don't like certain stations. Mm -hmm. And rightfully so. But I think that if we talk about media and what the media's role is, I think the media's role is always, is the same role that's played, is to tell the dom dominant stories, right. right? You give the dominant perspectives. And it doesn't allow the voices that come from these communities in Minneapolis and St. Paul, if that if it indeed is over fifty percent, you don't get you don't get that impression by watching the news. Right. And certainly there's I so I'd say that there's a lack of, of, of reporters of color and there's a lack of news stories covering communities of color. And I've, it's something like I have never seen. And we have very little media, uh, at least print media that can actually make uh, pick up the slack. You know, we have within the black community that may have a spokesman or insight. But those are are okay, but in many ways limited right. uh, in what they are able to do. But mm -hmm. but I, I I will say though, as somebody who is very active within the the um, media um, landscape here, um, I mean, I I think we definitely have one of the most vibrant alternative yeah. media landscapes yeah. anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so I think if you are hooked in. Like if you're just watching the television, what you know, and I'm not saying you're doing that, but you know, like then yeah, it's gonna be disappointing. It's gonna be you know, um, in a whitewashed. Place. Yeah, it's it's just not gonna represent us. And even as you said, if they do cover things like you know, it's kind of funny to me like to watch them cover Black Lives Matter. It's just kind of funny. Um, it's entertaining in a way that I don't think they intend it to be. Um, um, it again. If what's that phrase? If you have a hammer, all you're gonna see is um, Nail. nails, Nail. right? And so it's sort of they have this yeah. this one narrative of sort of like, well, these people are you know disrupting this. And I saw this one. I don't I forget which station. They're kind of all the same to yep. me. Yeah. And and so um, a nameless station. Yeah, and it was like um, this 
young white female reporter and they got the young, I mean the one thing is sort of like I see the same um, phenomenon that really happened during the civil rights movement where now it's like, oh we have to get a black reporter because we have to at least appear like we um, have some credibility talking about this stuff. So I've actually seen like a few black reporters and reporters from communities of color for the first time like covering some of this stuff in Black Lives Matter um, in the same way that the civil rights movement gave um, some um, black reporters the ability to move into the mainstream. Right. Um, so I'm seeing some of that, but it was just like this really like very surface level like race. Let's talk about race. Let's talk about my friends. Let's, like this sort of not talking about the structural issues, which like Black Lives Matter, like you can critique them on a lot of things, but they are really talking about structural issues, like structural issues mm -hmm. in the criminal justice system, structural issues in education, like the the you know prison to uh, the the school to prison pipeline, pipeline, all of this stuff, right? And so they're t they're just talking about this interpersonal stuff. It's very surface level, <coughs> but I just want to get to. I think that black millennials, um, in many ways, have changed up the game. Black Twitter is an uh -huh. endless yes. source of life for me. Yep. Endless source of life for me. You know, and I think that white America still has not gotten the message that who is the, the, the most likely person to use Twitter? A black person. Who is the second most likely? A Latino person, right? And, and, and so I feel like young millennials of color have really taken that particular technology and really just used it to talk back to some of the, a lot of these mainstream, um, whether it's the TV, whether it's print, whether it's internet, whether it's radio, whatever it is, right? Um, and it can be, you know, people talk about, oh, it's only 140 characters, yes. But the thing is you can link to like a lot of other long mm -hmm. things. Um, and so, I, and I think that like millennials of color have kind of figured, figured that out, right? It doesn't mean that everything is like instantly better or, you know, right. but I just think it's, it's changed things. And I do think that, um, yeah. Um, no. As an example, the swift response to Justice Scalia. Right. Oh, yes. That's a yes. perfect yes. example yes. Yes. of the way millennials are using yes. Twitter. I mean, right. that is that response ha because without that response, there's almost no response. Right. Right. So that's why I mean, right. Shannon is absolutely right. right about that.